Happy Wednesday and welcome to our webinar. We're gonna give folks a little bit more time to gather into this space. So we'll start in about two minutes. Thank you. Okay, happy Wednesday, and thank you for sharing your beautiful morning with us. Um, we are excited that you're here for the Applications of Health Equity and Dementia Caregiving Policy and Practice. So I am Lauren Parker. I am um, on faculty at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, but more importantly, and why we're here today, is that I'm a member of the Health Equity Task Force of the Bold Center. And so my research is all about how to address the cultural needs of caregivers for people living with dementia, and specifically thinking about communities that have been historically marginalized. So I'm so excited today is because we're talking all about health equity, and that's so central to my work and a lot of the work of you all here on the webinar today. So we're so excited that you're here. Next slide, please. So to get us started, I wanted to provide a little bit of information about the bold Public Health Center of Excellence on Dementia Caregiving. We are designed to support state, tribal, and local public health agencies as they develop their dementia caregiving um, programs and initiatives. So we provide a variety of services, but some of our services are aimed at improving access to evidence-based programs and best practices. We also facilitate connections and collaborations among public health agencies, and we provide a wide range of um, services to different types of service organizations. And then what I think is most um, important is that we provide technical assistance for identifying and selecting, implementing effective public health interventions and strategies. So if you want more information, please feel free to visit our website and you can access our websites through this QR code. So our event today is um, hosted by the Health Equity Task Force. The Health Equity Task Force is uh, made up or comprised of a great and dynamic team of scholars, and we work across the center to ensure health equity is centered in our programming, and our resources, and our leadership. We provide specific support by partnering with the center to identify and develop and disseminate culturally tailored and caregiving centered materials, tools, and supports to public health interest groups. We also provide feedback to the Bold Center on engagement strategies to ensure the inclusion of diverse and minority serving interest groups. And so our team is made up of um, four dynamic um, individuals. I say dynamic because I get to work with these great, um, great women. So I want to acknowledge Robin Frazier, Dr. Sean Williams, and also Dr. Fayron Epps. So before we get started, I want to say we're all, a lot of us here on this call are scientists. And so we love feedback, we love additional information, and we love data. So please, at the end of our presentation today, um, leave feedback for us so that we can improve or we can continue to have programming on this topic and other topics that are central and important to you all. So if you would like to leave feedback, here's a QR code here um, that you can open a survey using your phone or you can click the link in the chat. We'll offer it at this time and then we'll also provide a link at the end of the webinar. And so one last thing before we get started, we want to have a poll question and the poll is going to pop up in the chat. 
we would like to identify who is in the room. So if you can answer this poll and you can identify in what capacity are you attending this event? Are you a bold public health agency, a non-bold public health agency, community organization, service provider, a person living with dementia? Are you an interested caregiver or community partner, or you are a care or clinical professional, or are you something other? I'll give you a few moments to answer this question. The great thing about the poll app is that we get to see about how many people um, participated in this poll. And so we have a great number. About 79% of you all have participated in, the, in this poll question. So thank you. So the overwhelming majority of um, people in the audience today are community organizations and service providers. And that is followed by um, other. So if you're other, it'd be interesting to see what other consists of if you feel comfortable putting it in the chat, just so we can know who's in the room. Um, so thank you so much for participating in this poll. So I get the opportunity and great pleasure to welcome our panelists. Um, I'm going to start off by introducing Dr. Paris or Dr. A.J. Atkins Jackson. Um, Dr. Paris is a multidisciplinary community partner, health equity researcher, and assistant professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Sociomedical Sciences in the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University. Dr. AJ's research investigates the role of structural racism on healthy aging for historically marginalized populations like Black and Pacific Islander communities. Dr. AJ is a HBCU alumna of the Psychiatric Doctoral Program at Morgan State University and a board member of the Society for Analysis of African American Public Health Issues. We're so excited for Dr. Atkins to speak. She'll be our first speaker. But before we get to Dr. Atkins, I'll go ahead and introduce the next um, the other two speakers. We're also glad that we have um, Rita Shalow, excuse me, Shola, excuse me. She is um, the Senior Director of Caregiving at the AARP Public Policy Institute. In her role, she drives the development of family caregiving initiatives by providing constant expertise, both within AARP and in partnership with a range of external collaborators. Her work bridges policy and research to practice centered on identifying and supporting needs of diverse family caregivers. In collaboration with clinical experts and key partners, she leads the development of programs and tools that enable healthcare professionals to better recognize the diverse needs of family caregivers and provide support to them across settings. And last, we will hear from Edie Yao. She is the Senior Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Engagement for the Alzheimer's Association, leading strategic initiatives to reach underserved communities in the pursuit of health equity. She leads national partnerships to increase access to resources and supports for all those affected by Alzheimer's and other dementia. Yao collaborates with partners to spearhead initiatives that are culturally tailored, ensuring communities have access to Alzheimer's and dementia education and resources to reduce the racial and ethnic disparities in dementia care. As a result of her leadership, the association has broadened its reach in Native and Asian American communities. As you can tell by the bios that I have read, we have a wonderful panelist, and I'm so looking forward to an engaged conversation. While the panelists are um, speaking, please feel free to put questions in the Q&A box. And then also we'll have time for question and answers at the end of the conversation. So we're so looking forward to these wonderful panelists and I will turn the um, stage over to Dr. AJ. Thank you so much. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I am AJ, and I am essentially your scene setter for health equity, but what uh, the organizers could not have known um, at the time that I was asked is that I'm also probably your scene setter for caregiving because I am a caregiver of a person living with dementia. My grandmother, my mother, and I share caregiving responsibility. And so throughout this presentation, you'll see pre uh, pictures of her 
And um, in the Q&A, we can talk about my experiences and the barriers because they are many. They are many. Um, and they are stressful. Um, last night while I was in our graduation procession, uh, my grandmother was rushed to ER. Um, and so I was literally in stuck in a procession, texting back and forth my family, different strategies. Luckily, I sat next to an MD that was able to decode some of the things the doctor was saying to my family, and I was able to advocate from afar. Um, but it is it is an ongoing challenge and granny is still in the hospital. Um, so I'm actually gonna head there later today. If you're not familiar with me or any of my work, I sort of use this web of causation that my colleagues have developed um, to think about the structural determinants of racism and their impact on aging. So I use this model of racialization where we've all been given some arbitrary category of a racial group uh, that's supposed to denote how we look and somehow where we come from. Um, but they really are arbitrary, right? They're assumptions that are being made. And because of that grouping of individuals, especially in the last 500 years, we've seen sort of disproportionate exposure to violence, discrimination, uh, and the proliferation of science's obsession with these racialized categories. And so what I've done is sort of tease apart the impact of this racialization through things like exposure to historic lynchings, to disproportionate incarceration, and show their relationship to multidimensional aging, like biological aging through C-reactive protein and cognitive decline. I've also been able to show how healthy food access and 90 years of socioeconomic dis um, disparities um, can be related to cognitive decline over time. I do that work because I strongly believe in this sort of explanation given by Dr. Braveman about what health equity is. Uh, Dr. Braveman says, pursuing health equity means pursuing the elimination of such health disparities and inequalities. Now, I find this to be very important because no matter how you might see health equity, I think that it is always action oriented. It is in process, it is in motion. It's not just a goal we're trying to achieve some high up health equity, but it's something we're actively steadily working on. But that goal, that mountaintop is the elimination of the disparities that we often observe too much in a lot of the outcomes that we study. And so I study these determinants, or for me, the star of the show, whether it's racism, social, structural determinants, residential segregation, whatever terms you prefer to use, I study that as my actual verb, as my movement towards eliminating these disparities by illuminating their impact on our elders. So I want you to think about for a second, what is your role in the journey of actively practicing health equity. And I want you to start with thinking about where your field has located you. I find too often our fields train us to examine exposures only, or maybe you're from what I call the benchologies and you study the mechanistic pathways, or maybe you're in a space where you only focus on the outcomes, the actual disease or outcome you're studying. So think about that for a second. How have you been located to focus on one part of the pathway? And now that you've identified that you have deficits in the other areas, how can you push past these disciplinary silos to complete the story? Because this is the full story for the people that we interact with. I also want you to think about the ways that you've deleted or forgotten the memories that you hold yourself about what's real in the world. Uh, I can speak for the scientists in the room. I don't know how we walk all up in our offices and act like everything in the world is not happening. It's happening for the people we dare to call participants, dare to call patients. So why isn't it happening for us? I'm from Tongva land, which is South Central Los Angeles. I grew up in the riots. 
Um, I have a very intimate relationship with the police running up and through my house with a no knock warrant. Um, so I know these exposures intimately to know that if they've impacted me and I'm 40, what have they done to my elders over time repeatedly? And one big exposure for me was Prop 187, seeing the xenophobia, the hatred towards immigrants. You can imagine Los Angeles is an epicenter for immigration, especially in the 90s as NAFTA is closing down farmland. So you have farmers crossing the border, desperate to make a way of life for their families, living in neighborhoods where predominantly people racialized as Black. And so I'm hearing these stories, seeing these experiences, but then seeing the hatred uh, propagated through our media towards these individuals. How does that then get deleted when you start to do the science? I know this is impacting all of the care and the life that is occurring in our neighborhoods. Why are we forgetting that? Why don't we interrogate the assumptions that we make about things that because we know a disease or a health outcome to be occurring underneath the skin, which is biological, we instantly jump to genetics, right? Although there's so many levels that could be occurring before that. And then we allow genes to be conflated with ancestry. We allow ancestry to be conflated with nationality as if people don't move around all the time. And if we had to trace nationality ancestrally, we would all be from the same place. Um, but then we allow ourselves to assume a whole nation, even though people can't get along in our own neighborhood, that a whole nation would have one universal culture. So that allows us to say things like the Chinese culture and the Mexican culture. Well, we know better, right? We conflate these things. And that allows us to just easily slide into a place where we're seeing race in this very monolithic, conflated way. And then we use as a as the scientific tale where we end up comparing each other in this ahistoric way, as if these categories always existed, as if they're biological facts, when really it wasn't the role of scientists in the most recent colonial era that solidified these categories, that created these categories to justify the differences among us. And then we use those categories to then blame people's genes, blame their culture or blame their behavior for the experiences that they're having in our society. So I want you to think about that for a second. How has your training allowed you to believe some of these myths about the differences among us? And then what has your own experiences taught you about those differences and how real they may be for people? So I write a lot about history and, and retelling these things because if we don't excavate them, if we don't tell this in a different story, then we never get to health equity, right? We keep ignoring the root cause of what is happening and science's role in that problem. And so I do wanna to talk to you today about one determinant in particular that tends to be prolific across fields and has different facets to it, which is where you live. This is a big one um, for most people because it can dictate your access to resources, especially historically over time. Many of you might be familiar with these kind of redlining uh, maps, but they're meant to denote the ways lands were segregated um, at a particular time in history in the early 1900s through the 1970s. And, and unfortunately, many of these neighborhoods have not been desegregated. So you'll see they exist as they were 100 years ago. This is a redlining map of Syracuse where the red area was meant to denote areas that were undesirable and where predominantly people racialized as Black lived. This is the area that my grandmother grew up in in this red area. This is another way of looking at that red line map with two highways that were built through those neighborhoods of people racialized as black. So as you think about these determinants that I'm bringing up for you and you think about your pursuit of health equity, how can you imagine the exposures that our elders endure? 
How can you imagine the difficulties with aging in place, with caregiving, when you have a highway that now separates you from your family on the other side and you got to drive one to two, five miles around the highway in order to get to a loved one? These are the elders that are ours today that we're caring for, that we're loving. This is the world they live in. This is the world they've been living in for a long time. I also think about things like displacement. What is the role of displacement in caregiving? This is mi otra abuelita, my other grandmother who left El Salvador during the war to come to the US. And when I think about the way care has been structured around her having to take her back and forth to El Salvador, um, before she passed, my uh, my adopted mom, this is my adopted family, having to um, take her remains back to El Salvador after she passed years ago. Um, what, you know, what is that experience like? Um, but then what is that experience like over history, right? Our ancestors have been surviving this kind of disrespect, this kind of displacement. You better believe during sort of the inquisition of the Americas and colonization, we had elders and caregiving occurring and people were being displaced in the middle of this kind of caregiving. Imagine a trail of tears where you have elders you have to care for. Imagine a slave trade where you are literally exporting people, separating them from their families, from their maybe familiar responsibilities, where you're creating elders in a place where people have the responsibility of working sun up to sun down. How do you care for your loved ones under such conditions? How do you care for your loved ones under your, your land being colonized and taken from you? 70 to 90% of your natural resources being exported that your elders probably need, right? But this is sort of the story over time that some groups have faced. Now, probably a prominent part of uh, where you live is where you get care because we find overwhelmingly there are fewer areas for healthcare in, in places that were residentially segregated where you had people racialized as black. But as my colleague here, Dr. Akre, shows us in her recent publication, many of these hospitals, about 80%, exhibit racial patterning in their admissions where they're not letting in older adults racialized as Black, even though the market area, the zip code area around the hospital is around residents that are racialized as Black. And we see this most in cities like New York, Chicago, and Detroit, which we know have high populations of people racialized as Black. Where you play, I find, is really what people think about when they think of social determinants, because they think of it as a leisure activity. But that's dictated by where you live as well. Um, how much we forget things like Seneca Village, which was this neighborhood of people racialized as Black who you can imagine worked their lifetimes to own this property in New York to only have the city forcibly remove them through eminent domain, relocate them far away, and then build a park where their neighborhoods used to be that these individuals don't even get access to. And those parks are far from neighborhoods racialized as Black. This is my grandmother here, my birth grandmother. And she was known for taking her son, who you see there, and my mother on a bus all the way across Los Angeles just to sit in some grass. You see the joy right here she has in being able to just do so. But then I think about the people who are trying to age and care for loved ones when those areas are being taken from them. During the pandemic, as a Los Angeles girl, I love the beach. That was my space. I used to take my birth mom, pack her up in the car, drive her to the beach and just let the breeze, you know, do its thing and make us feel better. I can't imagine the situation we're seeing in Puerto Rico where public Areas like the beaches are being privatized and taken away from people. How are you supposed to thrive under such conditions? So this creates a situation where where you live ends up being the place where you're stuck. It ends up being the place where you're surviving 
and not thriving. It also ends up being the place where you die to bring it back to those determinants like violence that communities see. These are all cisgender women racialized as black who were killed by the police in the last 20 years. So these areas end up being not only resource deficient, but you know, places where violence occurs against people. So when we see these sort of beautiful studies that outline that stress of caregivers leads to sleep disturbance and depressive symptoms, that that stress is caused by a lack of support of financial services, lack of healthcare support, transportation barriers, lack of relief, hallelujah, I cannot begin to tell you, yes. Then I want you to think about all those structural determinants and how it's creating those things that we do see in the literature on caregiving. I lastly wanna shout out this paper right here because I feel like this uh, perfectly tells the story of my birth mother and myself and what we've been enduring with getting care for my grandmother, um, how the healthcare system has really ended up being like a police force to us where we're constantly watching what we say, what we do because um, people are documenting our behavior and dictating what access to resources we can have, uh, despite my grandmother being hospitalized multiple times in the last month, um, they refused to unlock hospice care or palliative care services, which would give us some in-home help, which would be that relief, right? Instead of me having to fly back from New York to Los Angeles every other week to relieve my mom, we could get more help. Um, but you know, due to this broken system, due to these payer sources dictating the kind of care we can get, we see this level of discrimination. So as I say, Granny is, you know, holding on. She's doing her thing, you know. So send some love to, to Granny, baby, uh, um, in the hospital right now. And uh, I look forward to gossiping with you in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation and a great overview of health equity. Now we'll um, pass the stage over to um, Rita. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and thank you, Dr. AJ, for really, really, um, you know, just putting us in a place where we really understand what equity means. And I so appreciate uh, your verbiage around active, around illuminating impact on our elders. And um, I, I could not have said it better myself um, in terms of the depths of what you talked about. Um, hello to all of the participants. Um, it really is an honor to be on this panel um, and to talk a bit about um, policy and practice as it relates to health equity. Um, next slide. So I wanna talk about a few things um, within my time, really looking at uh, health equity and policy supporting family caregivers. Um, what are some key components, walking through key components in developing inclusive policies? Uh, strategies for engaging community in policy development? And then highlighting some uh, promising policy and practice um, supporting family caregivers, um, uh, both at the federal and state level. Um, I, I too, like Dr. AJ, I have been a family caregiver. Um, so I bring myself um, and that experience into all that I do and into presentations. I cared for my mother who lived with frontal temporal dementia for 15 years. And while eight years of doing that, I was also a sandwich generation caregiver to my two children who were born into this caregiving family themselves. Next slide. I wanna just spend a couple of moments talking about research policy to practice and the pipeline of what that is. I think, unfortunately, so often when we look at these three areas, we look at them as being uh, in silos. 
And as we all know, family caregivers, those living with dementia, they don't live in silos. Their lives and the different aspects of their lives all intersect. And so the fact that we um, in the professional space, uh, whether it's healthcare, policy, academia, um, really look at things in silos, um, really explain many of the broken systems that we expect family caregivers and those living with many different conditions to exist in and to, and to survive in. Next slide. And so when we talk about health equity and policies um, to support family caregivers, it really is about, again, as Dr. AJ said, it's got to be active, right? It's not something that is just on paper. It really is about improving the lives of older adults, um, those living with disabilities, and family caregivers. And it's ensuring that all families are supported. Um, it's not too often and in the past, particularly around family caregiving, as we relied solely on, on research, um, many policies and practices were developed around research saying that the average family caregiver was a 48-year-old white woman. And so as you look at policies that were centered on a very um, a small number of individuals or one particular group of individuals, imagine why policies have not reflected what the needs of a wide variety of family caregivers really need, um, as well as the practices that come out of and are driven by those policies. So looking at health equity in this space really does recognize, again, that many communities face barriers in accessing the quality health care and caregiver supports that Dr. AJ talked about. Next slide. The other way. And so I want to talk a little bit about uh, key components in really developing inclusive policies. It's really critical. So often we see policymakers that um, unfortunately, again, are living in silos. They're, they're maybe in a bubble and not really understanding the importance to be inclusive. And when that happens, so many individuals are not served by the policies that really should be serving them. Those policies were never designed for them. And in order to develop more inclusive policies, there are several things that can support that. So the first is a needs assessment. So you have an idea of a policy that you want to create that is going to support, say, a family caregiver of someone living with dementia. But what does that mean? Um, when you look at, at really trying to develop that policy and being inclusive, it means really understanding the unique health needs that exist for multiple communities that may be dealing with some of the same issues. So there are many challenges that are faced by diverse populations, and each of those challenges are impact, impact individuals differently depending on the communities that they are from. And so if you're going to develop of inclusive policy, you have to be sure that you are looking across race and eth race ethnicity. You have to be sure that you're looking at different types of family caregiver situations, um, ge ge geographic locations, um, LGBTQ plus and other diverse family caregivers and what are their needs and talking to those individuals. It's also critical that you have intentional inclusive policy design. So it's not just about saying, oh, this is an inclusive policy, but that you are intentionally saying, we are going to do certain things. And what does that look like? It looks like create, crafting policies that specifically include provisions for those who are most often underserved or overlooked that may not be the most prominent, but that are still experiencing many of the challenges uh, that are faced when you're trying to develop these policies. And this includes developing culturally tailored care, making sure that there's language accessibility and really consideration of non-traditional family structures. 
As we look at allocation of resources, it's very critical that we ensure that resources for family caregivers are distributed in such a way that actually compensates for existing inequalities. There are so many times when uh, a policy may have be, may be the best laid plan, but unfortunately, because there was not an adequate allocation of resources, then individuals are not able to utilize them. And if they are, oftentimes it is based on community. And so ensuring that there is equity across the distribution of those resources is critical. And support for family caregivers. You know, as we look at health equity, oftentimes family caregivers are negated. There is this thought that family caregivers are doing it um, out of love, and they are. They're doing it out of obligation, and they are. But that does not mean that they don't need help and they don't need more support. So it's really important that as we develop uh, policies specifically around um, family caregivers, around supporting older adults, that there is that support for family caregivers, such as training, such as assisting them financially, and providing mental health services and especially um, making sure that there's a focus on those from underserved backgrounds. Next slide. It's also important that we build legislative and regulatory frameworks that again, are very reflective of the communities that we should be serving. And what does that look like? It means really actively implementing laws and regulations that serve to protect and empower caregivers and those that they are caring for, especially those living with dementia. It also means that there are penalties for discrimination, that there are penalties against discrimination for fam of family caregivers, of those that they're caring for, and that there really are robust enforcement mechanisms. It's not enough to say that there will be a penalty. What happens and how do you understand how that penalty comes about is through enforcement. It's also very important that there's evaluation of utilization. There are so many policies that because they have not been properly implemented, and they are not really being evaluated. There are policies on the books that really should be supporting family caregivers, that should be supporting those living with dementia, but unfortunately, there has not been an evaluation of those to see where disparities may be occurring. And without that evaluation, without understanding who is actually utilizing it, we hear oftentimes policymakers say, well, we're not gonna give more money to that because it's not being utilized. Well, why isn't it being utilized? So again, and you in, in really attempting to develop inclusive policies, you've got to do a consistent analysis and evaluation of that utilization and make tweaks um, depending on what that utilization, um, uh, what the work around the evaluation actually shows. Next slide. So I just wanted to talk very high level about some strategies for engaging community and policy development. And I know there are many researchers, uh, many of you on this call right now that do community-based research. I want to think about it in terms of policy development and it really does not differ that much. If we're doing policy development, we have to understand the various communities that we serve. And that's not going to come from a Google search that's going to come from actually interacting with those communities. And so I highlight here just a few things. Uh, partnerships with community-based caregiving organizations. There are a number of community-based organizations um, across the country, both coming at it from a national perspective, but they're also happening in faith-based communities. They're happening in senior centers. So understanding uh, what those community offerings are and engaging with them is critical. Developing caregiver advisory councils and work groups. Uh, again, bringing caregivers and those with these lived experiences to the table can only help to inform your policy. Additionally, doing surveys and focus groups, 
um, hosting town hall meetings and workshops, where again, it's not just bringing individuals to say what they have to say, and you're not taking into account what they're sharing, they're giving of their time, they're giving of their stories. So taking that information and actually applying it as you are developing that policy. And increasingly, the utilization of social media. There are a number of social media influencers, particularly in the dementia caregiving space, that absolutely share their stories day in and day out. You are visually seeing them share their stories, share the account of, um, of the frustrations and challenges they have with the system as they are trying to keep individuals, their parents, their grandparents, and others at home. So utilizing those stories, reaching out to those individuals, providing support, and therefore really understanding the policies that need to occur and be developed. Next slide. So I wanted to highlight uh, just a couple of promising uh, policies and practices, especially within the dementia space, um, that really speak to this idea of community engagement. The first is the national strategy to support family caregivers. Um, this is very critical. Um, this is something um, that is at the federal level and after several years, um, and much community involvement. There's a family caregiver council with representatives from disability communities, from a variety of caregiving communities across race and ethnicities um, that is very diverse and is able to speak to the experiences of family caregivers. And from that and from actual community engagement across the states, um, a national strategy was developed. And that national strategy allowed um, for 500 recommendations at the federal level, the state level, and is also engaging uh, employers and other entities that enact with family caregiver, interact with family caregivers. I know many of you are familiar with the guide model, guiding and improved dementia experience. Um, this is a very exciting resource and tool um, that is going to be used to really support family caregivers in their management of dementia care. I think a very important place for equity within uh, this model is ensuring that all family caregivers, again, have the supports that they need, the culturally tailored supports, that the various dementias, as somebody that cared for somebody living with FTD, it was extremely difficult to find resources outside of the Association for Frontal Temporal Dementia that really supported my journey uh, as a family caregiver um, of someone outside, caring for someone outside of Alzheimer's. And so again, the providers that are going to be community-based, it's very critical that they have training and understanding and are inclusive of a variety of family caregivers. Next slide. At the state level, I wanted to talk about a couple of things. The Caregiver Advise, Record, and Enable Act um, is uh, also called the CARE Act. And it is very, um, this is a CARE Act that is uh, in hospital settings that supports family caregivers in hospital settings in 45 states and territories. And again, it's, it came about from talking to family caregivers, from research done by AARP, our home alone research, to really be able to understand um, what caregivers were missing in the health system. And there's a lot of work to go with that, um, but it continues on and around utilization and implementation. Some of the states are actually making amendments to what they initially put out because they saw that it was impacting caregivers differently. Um, family caregiver tax credits and paid family leave laws all speak to the importance of supporting family caregivers from a financial position and really recognizing what they do and how they serve others and ensuring that they are protected, their jobs are protected, and they're able to provide the care that they desire, but still be able to receive their income that they deserve. And these are just some examples of uh, very intentional policies that were inclusive of family caregivers. Next slide. 
And so in closing, this is a slide of my mom and, and my daughter. And I love this picture because it really, when I look at it, it really, I, I think about um, all that went into providing that care, but also into her as an individual and into the relationship that I, as that caregiver, was able to create between her and my children. But I'm also recognized, I also recognize that caregivers across this country, they face an immense cost of care, an opportunity cost, a financial cost, and a cost to their health and well-being. And it is critical through health equity and through the development of inclusive policies that we improve those uh, situations that family caregivers are in and really help them to support not only those living with dementia, but help support themselves as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, these presentations are so dynamic. And so I'm so looking forward to this last presentation. And thank you for everyone who has who have been putting questions in the Q&A box. We will save some of those for the end for the moderated, the moderated Q&A section. So Edie, thank you for being the last speaker. Um, the, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And it's an honor being on the panel with our two previous speakers, Dr. AJ and Rita. So um, my hope is to kind of round this out with some uh, examples of how we work with communities and also to talk a little bit more about guide. Um, so next slide, please. If So just looking at this uh, image on the left, this is what dementia care, uh, seeking care um, looks like today. And if it looks like a maze, it's because it is. It's, uh, as you've heard, if you have, have had personal experience um, and having worked in communities for many years with the Alzheimer's Association, I have heard how uh, challenging it is. And with my own mother-in-law watching her, they were lucky to have me uh, in this uh, field to help navigate, but it's, it's a real challenge. And so guide, is a great example of something that has come out of the policy work. And so last year, it was really through the Comprehensive Care um, for Alzheimer's Act that this uh, was born as a way to reshape the way we provide dementia care. And so it's this idea of dementia care navigation. And the three aims of GUIDE are one, to improve quality of life for people living with dementia, to reduce the strain on unpaid caregivers, and three, help people live in communities, help people living with dementia to stay in their own homes and in their own communities. Next slide. Every year, the Alzheimer's Association puts together a facts and figures report, and we always have a special report that is um, a companion piece. And in this, uh, this recent one, it's entitled Mapping a Better Future for Dementia Care Navigation. We surveyed uh, over 1,500 dementia caregivers, recent or current dementia caregivers of different racial and ethnic backgrounds, and also healthcare workers, over 1,200, to get a sense of what are some of these experiences and attitudes on dementia care navigation. Next slide. So, High level, some of the takeaways from this survey, the dementia caregiver survey, uh, no surprise, but 70% say care coordination is stressful. How do you manage putting all of these different pieces together? Um, as you heard earlier, cost of care and care co coordination are top stressors. Also, it's important to show that 97% of them said, yes, having navigation support would be helpful. And it may even influence uh, who they might choose as their care provider, their primary care provider, or their health system. Next slide. When we look at the healthcare worker side, 60% of workers surveyed say the current healthcare system, it's not effective helping people living with dementia and their caregivers. So what's, what's in place isn't working. Um, 
we also uh, saw that nearly half of these healthcare workers uh, say that their employers' practices in hospitals don't have a clear defined process. Um, and so could that be um, fi fine-tuned a little bit more for people with MCI, Alzheimer's disease, or related dementias? And then lastly, um, majority of healthcare workers who actually do the assisting of dementia caregivers have no formal dementia care training. I think about one of the um, comments a colleague made, uh, which was, uh, the caregiver in the family is like the chief medical officer, but really has to figure everything out as they go. Next slide. So who are the people that actually end up providing this navigation type of uh, support and services? Largely, they end up falling on the nurse um, or the nurse assumes that responsibility, social workers, physician assistant, community health workers. So we're starting to see a lot of um, uh, health systems working with community health workers. Um, and this uh, uh, category of um, navigators are taking on a larger role. And then you can see it, it goes down further. Next slide. When we're talking about health equity, one of the things that I think is consistent that, that comes up is the cultural competency piece, the cultural humility, the cultural relevancy. Do the care navigators understand the background, um, cultural background, racial, ethnic background of the person that's being cared for? And you can see from this survey that the, uh, the dementia caregivers felt that this is highly important. Nine in 10 uh, Asian, Black, and Hispanic caregivers said this is incredibly important. I would also note that among the Asian caregivers, uh, only 54% said that they would rate this service as good or excellent in terms of understanding the racial and ethnic background um, of, of their person. Next slide. So of all the services that one might provide in dementia care navigation, what are the most valuable services uh, for patients and families? And you can see that the top one is referrals to community support services and resources. Um, where do I go for additional help? And I always look at it as accessing professional help does not uh, take the place of family help. And I think sometimes that often ends up being um, the, the tension in families. If I, if I access whatever it is, respite services, um, education, adult service, adult daycare, um, does that mean that I'm not doing my job as a caregiver, as a daughter, as a family member? And I always tell people it's not an uh, uh, a but either or, but it's and, right? Um, training on how to care for someone with dementia. So that actual training of what, what needs to be different in how you communicate with the person, managing behaviors you see is on here, um, and certainly support in the emotional support and the cultural support. Next slide. So the Alzheimer's Association is, um, excited to embark on this new program, Dementia Care Navigation Service, um, in partnership with Ripple. And uh, it's just getting ready to launch, so I don't have more details, but it will be piloted in four states, and you can find out more information here. But the idea is that very thing of dementia care navigation and working in partnership with health systems, with primary care providers. And so the way I imagine it is instead of just giving someone a brochure of the Alzheimer's Association or of a family care uh, resource center, um, it's actually then walking them through and having them assigned or um, paired with a dementia care navigator. Next slide. So I wanna provide um, an example of how 
the Alzheimer's Association, we partner in community and also looking at some of our uh, underrepresented populations um, that need um, certainly may need to understand uh, more about Alzheimer's and dementia in general before they, and that's what I often hear is, we don't even have the information about Alzheimer's and dementia to know that one, I might be a caregiver or recognize um, the importance of early detection and diagnosis and therefore getting the help that's needed. And so we partner with National Indian Council on Aging um, and also Indian Health Service, as well as um, International Association for Indigenous Aging. Uh, they have been incredibly influential in the uh, uh, Healthy Brain Initiative Roadmap for Indian Country. But one of the things that we do is really listening to them. What is needed about for to assist um, tribes uh, in, in addressing dementia, knowing that American Indians and Alaska Natives uh, are disproportionately impacted by Alzheimer's and dementia? And it really starts with education, providing that information about um, what it is and what are the opportunities for seeking out support. And Indian Health Service is the federal health system uh, for American Indians and Alaska Natives. It's a decentralized system, um, but we've really started to partner with them to provide education, support for their cognitive screening pilot programs, um, and connecting uh, the IHS facilities with Alzheimer's Association chapter resources so that should they encounter people who are caring for someone with dementia, people living with dementia, that this is an added resource to what they have in the family, in the community, and in addition to IHS services. Um, we also work with IHS uh, to think about the pathways for early detection and diagnosis. And so looking at how can we work together to make this easier and make this more accessible to more people. Next slide. In our pursuit of health equity at the Alzheimer's Association, we really believe in partnership um, and to build trust in communities. It means that we need to work on being trustworthy. And we have over 30 national partners. You can see um, they cover many different uh, populations represented um, and also looking at different ways that we connect uh, with community organizations. Certainly nurses are up here um, well represented uh, and really thinking about how do we enlist uh, their understanding, their expertise of the communities that they work for, the populations that they advocate for, um, to better understand how we can provide our services, our resources in the best way uh, received and um, culturally uh, relevant. So an example, next slide, is Unforgettable, which is a uh, play, a stage play that we've put on. We are in our second year of offering this. Um, and in the first year when it was launched in July, 2022, uh, the Alzheimer's Association reached 10,000 new constituents uh, with over 700,000 media impressions and working with 150 local and national partners. And it's a stage play about an African-American family that is in denial and dealing with Alzheimer's. Um, grandma has Alzheimer's and, and through this process of navigating, how do you seek help? And also how might you um, consider the benefits of participating in clinical trials? And so that's another important um, awareness uh, area that, that we're also looking at. But you can see that in 2024, we have 10 new cities. We've been in Miami um, and Indianapolis uh, and I believe Pittsburgh and Detroit are coming up soon. Um, but this is a way of doing something that is culturally relevant, 
uh, edutainment. It's it's free to the public. Um, the play is uh, often in community. It's in community. It's been held at historically black uh, theaters and um, a way to provide some education, but also great entertainment for the whole family. Um, and so we've had some good success with this. Next slide. I also just wanna mention the Healthy Brain Initiative, which is uh, around risk reduction, but this um, re we're doing a revision of the Roadmap for Indian Country, which will be called the Roadmap for American Indians and Alaska Native uh, Peoples. And it's in the conversations with the leadership committee that represents uh, various tribes, um, and tribal health organizations, uh, one of the things that keeps coming up is around the caregiving piece. And so while we look at risk reduction, um, the caregiving piece is very much a part of that. And it's a way to uh, engage tribes, tribal health organizations, clinics, pub taking that public health approach to really think about how can we uh, support um, this very population in addressing dementia in ways that make sense for them. This will come out in the fall. Next slide. It's just a reminder of we, the Alzheimer's Association has 75 chapters across the country and we have a 24 seven helpline that is available um, as well as uh, chapter resources that includes education programs support groups uh, that are extraordinarily um, valuable to caregivers and people living with dementia, care consultation, um, and certainly early stage programs. And my final slide um, really shows the hope of what dementia care could look like. And so less of a maze, more streamlined, uh, lower Medicare costs, and certainly improved outcomes for patients and caregivers. And again, all of this thinking about how do we make sure that we are reaching the underserved communities, those that are disproportionately impacted um, by dementia, um, and making sure that they have access to all of these services that are very much needed in families. And my Final slide is resources um, that I had referenced that you can look up. And that's it, thank you. Wow, I, that's all I can say is wow, wow, wow. And I think everyone um, in the audience is saying wow to, to these wonderful presentations. So I'm gonna ask all of the panelists to um, come off mute and to come on video um, so, so we can see your face and to answer some questions. Okay. Perfect. And again, thank you so much. Um, you know, it's always great to hear the science and the research and the, pro the policies and the programming. And it's also just, it's so much more meaningful to me uh, when I hear these stories and people share their own experiences um, with caregiving and providing care to a family member with um, dementia. So thank you so much for sharing and being vulnerable and open enough to share the experiences that you shared. So thank you so much for that. I, I really appreciate it. Um, and so I'll just go ahead and get started with some questions that I see in the Q&A box. And as these questions come about, as we're having conversations, people in the audience, please feel free to add more questions. Um, so the the first question that I'll propose to the group is that um, where do panelists see formal caregivers in this work? How can we help out um, burnt, excuse me, how can we help burnt out caregivers heal while keeping the work going from a micro to macro level? Anyone can jump in. <laughs> So I, I just saw something in the chat that I lost, but I didn't know there was a dementia navigation navigation care program. So when I hear navigation, I, I think back to my days when I was in cancer over a decade ago, and we used to do these peer navigator programs where people who survived longer 
would navigate newer survivors through the healthcare journey, help them figure out what medications. So I'm assuming it's something similar like this. I think navigator programs will be fantastic. I am enrolled in the USC caregiver um, program and my my support service is very helpful to me having that individual that I can send an email literally at the beginning of Edie's talk my birth mother called me from the hospital and from the question she asked me I immediately emailed my person at USC and was like hey uh, do you know anything about this veteran paperwork that we got to fill out <laughs> um, those kind of programs, I think, help with burnout. And if 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 my mother didn't have to figure that out and then translate it to me, if I had a navigator that's like, okay, seeing what's going on with Granny, this is what I think you need to be aware of. Let me help you pull the paperwork and fill it out. That probably would be instrumental in breaking down some of the technology and informational structural barriers that many people are facing. Dr. AJ, I, I wanna say that you're right in that this dementia care navigation model comes from cancer clinics from the 1990s. And so that obviously showed that it worked. And then it also was replicated for other chronic diseases, kidney disease, um, uh, diabetes and and now dementia. So we it's it's exciting to see take a model that has worked and let's replicate this for this space as well. Um, I, I think also the issue of burnout, one of the things that I've seen um, again from a chapter perspective where I worked for uh, the Northern California, Northern Nevada chapter for many years is that we saw a trend that um, particularly Latino caregivers would call us an, when there was a crisis. So when you talk about burnout, we see that some particular groups of people may wait till it's very late. And it's maybe because they don't know the resources available um, and they haven't had access to the education around dementia, right? To know how can I manage this before it gets to a crisis where then I call for help. We've also seen some studies that show that Black caregivers may have less stress around caregiving, and I'm not sure why that is, if there's like a, more of a built-in support system in families and communities, but that's interesting. And then most recently, the um, special report uh, that I just referenced shows that Asian caregivers have found the most difficulty in accessing services and trying to navigate through all of these. And I wonder if language access uh, may be one of the issues, but again, also not knowing where to turn to because many of our older adults are immigrants um, and don't understand how the health systems work to begin with. So those are, those are some things that I would add to that um, question. Yeah, and just quickly, I would say I I always pivot back to one of the main reasons that caregivers are burned out is because of these broken systems. And so in so much of the work that I do, it's pushing back on healthcare systems and other leaders to say, this is what family caregivers need. You know, I spent a lot of time not being able to be my mother's daughter because I was her doctor, her nurse her lawyer, her social worker, all of that. And so the more that we can do on the professional side to say enough and to really create resources and tools for individuals so that we can kind of take the excuse away of we don't know what caregivers need. We know what caregivers need and it's really critical that we begin to better support them. I would also say um, support groups are really, really, really important. And there is a growing body of support groups. ARP has an online discussion group. Of course, the Alzheimer's Association has a wonderful support program. Um, and there are so many ways that individuals can connect with people like themselves. I think that's another important thing that has been missing. Oftentimes when you're burned out, it's because you don't 
know how to ask for help or you're scared to ask for help because traditionally there hasn't been anybody there to help you. So creating um, environments for caregivers to feel safe, to be able to share their stories, breathe, cry, whatever it is, goes a long way as well. Yeah, I so appreciate that last comment about um, breathing and creating space. You know, oftentimes with my research, I, I, do, I do appreciate the point, um, Edie, that you brought up that traditionally African-Americans have reported less stress. But it's so interesting when you talk with them, the experiences that they describe are stressful. So sometimes I think that there might be a measurement issue as it relates to stress. But some people just say, got to get it done. Like, I have a list of things to do, but I have to get it done. So that might not necessarily be stressful based on an item measure um, for a particular scale. But if you hear those those conversations, to me, it sounds stressful. Um, so I appreciate you raising those points and also saying traditional people who have been burdened, they just have to get up and do it. You know, so I think that's a mm -hmm. lot of when we think about burnout, especially going back to Dr. AJ's point, thinking historically these groups have had so many other um, challenges, traumas, stressors due to race, ethnicity, or just overall life, right, has hit them. So this added um, experience of being a caregiver just might be another check on their list of, I have to get it done. Um, so, so thankful for those comments. And so in that same vein, um, a question was proposed for um, Rita, and um, it was a question about, you mentioned engaging caregivers on social media media. So are there any successful efforts to organize caregivers themselves in a sustained network? You know, there are a lot of opportunities, I would say. I have been, as I said in my presentation, just so pleased to see this online community of family caregiver media influencers, social media influencers, that again, have been very open with who they are. I don't want to name any because then I'll miss somebody, but there are so many just being able to go onto IG or TikTok or whatever it is, and they are creating a network among themselves. Um, I think another thing is within AARP, for instance, um, we have created a network as well across our state offices um, and at the national level to really encourage family caregivers to share their stories, to share their experiences, and there are opportunities um, for them to connect. I really do understand this idea of a sustained network because behind people is power, right? That it, empowering individuals, which is something um, that we do at ARP, is really try to empower these caregivers in whatever way and whatever ability they have because they're caregiving um, to be advocates. Um, and not only to be advocates, but to know that there are resources to support them as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And so I'm going to just jump to a next question. Um, and this is for Edie. So um, what is the role of national organizations with a large footprint to empower communities to expand local offerings when their own programming is reduced and or their staff is significantly cut? Yeah, that, that's a big question. I, I think one of the examples I would give is, you know, through our policy efforts, we've certainly advocated for a number of these legislations, right? Um, the Comprehensive Care for Alzheimer's Act and thinking, thinking broadly and how that trickles down into communities. Um, and I also think about in uh, Indian Health Service, again, to provide a more specific example, that it was only it's only three years ago that they received um, federal appropriations for Alzheimer's and dementia specific uh, funding to issue out grants to uh, tribes or tribal health organizations that are reaching these populations of American Indians and Alaska Natives, and we've seen positive. Um, work in that and their federal appropriations increased the following year because we're seeing that demonstration of community engagement and community activation. So there's there's a role for national work for sure to think broadly. And I think Rita had shared, you know, advocating on behalf of family caregivers and getting their perspective in all of this is so important. And then there's also the need for communities to do the work that makes the most sense for their communities. Um, one size does not fit all. And so advocating for the different um, 
types of services needed uh, is is critically important. I think, you know, in, in the past, what, couple of decades, we've been advocating for additional funding for these uh, adult day programs, right, because their funding was cut, and, and we know how important those are locally. So all of that is is critical. So really lifting up those voices from a local perspective to a national is, is highly critical. Said my favorite buzzword, and that is adult day. It's a, that's my favorite home and community based uh, resource, and it's one of the most racially diverse, and it helps people stay in the community and stay home, which is a need that a lot of um, a lot of folks say that they want. So that was my favorite buzzword. So you got me excited and tingled all in the inside. So thank you for that. Um, and so I'm just going to go ahead and ask another question, um, and this is um, a great question. How will the Ripple Care how would the Ripple Care Navigation Service be different from the previous care navigation services offered by the association? Well, um, one is uh, looking at a different uh, pay payer model, so an alternative payer model. And I'm not as well versed around this, but certainly one of the issues around dementia care navigation, where you're having this, you know, formal service that can help you with medical and non-medical services um, that it's built in. And so I think historically it's people who can pay. It's a fee for service. And with this program, it will be working with health systems and primary care providers to um, be able to refer and work together. So the Alzheimer's Association will provide some of those services, but not all of them. And so Ripple will also provide some of the services. So together, we're able to um, hopefully make it less of a messy, convoluted process for family caregivers. Um, we don't currently offer this level of dementia care navigation that's in the works uh, today. Thank you for that. Um, and so please, if there's more questions, please feel free to put them um, in the chat. Um, I see there's a lot of conversation in the chat already. So thank you for everyone who are, who are sharing their stories and also um, extending out great presentations to all of the panelists themselves. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I'll go to another question and um, I'm hoping that I'm phrasing this right, but I'm gonna read it as is. Dementia is a neurodegenerative condition, but it's mostly addressed as a disease, especially with psychiatric manifestation. So the discrimination, so the discrimination mounting, how could we address this issue, how to avoid over-medicalization? And so I'm not sure if, um, if the question asker is asking if, if the, the role between discrimination and um, dementia, um, but do you all have any thoughts about that, that question? I do have some thoughts. Well, I'll come from multiple angles on this one. Um, we have found that the healthcare system is getting away with um, having its own rules that apply at different times. And so that's often the hard part of regulating the role of healthcare or the complicity of healthcare in structural racism. Because healthcare should actually be the number one structural resilience factor. It should be where the buck stops. No matter what happens in society, you get to a healthcare system, it stops the structural determinants from functioning. But it chooses to be complicit because then it adopts all these other policies that are really relevant to financing. The amount of resources the hospital has, the amount of beds they have available, uh, the amount of this medicine and so on and so forth, the, the relationships between doctors and some of these uh, pharmacies uh, and pushing some of the drugs. So when you ask the question, how can we uh, either regulate or, or start to dismantle this compounding effect? It often comes back to the role of healthcare professionals and lobbying on their own behalf um, to, to stop the system because we've seen policymakers be reluctant to interfere policy-wise on how healthcare is actually structured. 
Um, and so that means that physicians have the ability to decide to over-medicate an older adult who they see as sort of in the end, not having any promise of recovering because they have dementia. And so why not give you Lexapro and, you know, whatever else we need to do to sort of mute your emotional state. Um, so those are sort of some of the issues at play. Yeah, and I would piggyback onto that in full agreement and saying this is why it's so important for caregivers to be educated and understand because you don't know what you don't know. And so in so many communities, when we talk to uh, the healthcare provider, that healthcare provider is God with the little G, right? It, it, that individual, we don't know, we have to trust. And so by not asking some of those questions or not even knowing what questions to ask, so many uh, individuals do receive more medication than they should. They do receive um, treatment that they may not need or they don't, the caregiver themselves don't even know what services and supports they could get into community to achieve some of the same things that uh, individuals are looking for and that these older adults or those others with living with dementia actually need. So it really is important that we educate our family caregivers as well and empower them to speak up. That's the other piece too. Yeah, I find continuing to ask why. So last night, literally what was happening in graduation is as my family member would communicate with the doctor said, I'd break down the sentence and go, okay, so why is that the treatment? Of course, is that the typical procedure? These are the questions you ask back. And then the doctor would have to further explain or give up and walk out the room, um, which is sort of sometimes what some physicians do, like they just assume that you're agitated or don't understand and don't bother to explain. But that's no reason to keep poking uh, and keep asking, like, well, why this? Why did you come to that decision? Can you show me the policy? Can you explain to me how these decisions are made? Uh, to answer the question in the chat, I don't actually know the policy of Kaiser, why they won't prescribe palliative care or hospice care. Um, I asked about it, though. Can I see where this is written up in your policies? Like, can you provide this information on the criteria? Because it sounds like my grandmother meets the criteria for hospice care. So let me know how you're making your decisions and what notes are you putting in her chart? You know, um, it's so good that your grandmother has you, Dr. AJ, for that advocacy, right? And so it really sounds like we, it sounds like we are doing a better job with this, but really encouraging more caregivers and family members or people just taking care of somebody just because they want to help out someone with dementia, but to be their advocate. And how do we train people to be an advocate for their own selves and know their rights, know their responsibilities and know what's possible and really training them to go in and have these conversations with the healthcare system. So taking away that, I like how you said the little G for God, um, Rita, but taking away that power dynamic between the healthcare provider, healthcare system, and then the end user who are the people living with dementia, but to really encourage people to be advocates for themselves. Um, I know that we have a few moments left, but you know, I had a question as we were sitting here because it's, you know, I think that we have a ways to go, but I do think over the last um, few years, decades, um, that we have had made major strides as it relates to bringing up important health equity issues, um, really being mindful and making policies and legislation about um, making content more culturally tailored and relevant. So if you can, um, can you think about your hope for health equity and how your hope in health equity can improve outcomes um, for those um, who are caregivers or people with dementia or those who are living with dementia? So what is your hope for the future? Well, I'll go ahead and start as we're all looking at each other who's going to start. Um, I guess we've seen with so many other diseases, chronic diseases, that even in best case scenarios where we have systems in place, that there's still a lag and a gap in terms of who who benefits from services, who who gets early treatment, who gets who gets access to services. Um, and my hope is that with dementia care, that with all of these 
centers of excellence with all of these experts now looking at this and with more voices advocating for dementia care and, and more resources in this space that we can reduce the gap. Do you know what I mean? I, I, I hope that in five, 10 years, we're not still talking about uh, key underrepresented populations. And, and with the advancement of um, treatment options, hopefully we will see additional treatments for Alzheimer's and other dementias, that these are beneficial to all people and to look at particularly those that are disproportionately impacted, that they are well represented in clinical studies, in clinical trials, um, and that they have access to all of these services and treatments. Can I say ditto? Is that an answer? <laughs> no, I think that is really well said. I, I think for me, it is that this role of being a caregiver, of supporting a family member or a friend is normalized so much that, you know, it isn't a separate population. It isn't like something that it, the expectation is there, but that it is, a, it is a role that, as Edie said, is very much supported and that within various communities that individuals are empowered to recognize so that it's not... I, I go back to what you said, Edie, about you know research showing black caregivers aren't don't feel stress. That that doesn't occur anymore. That individuals are able to say and feel and be who they are, and that the systems that are meant to support them are actually created and developed so that they can be supported. So that somebody can say, "Yes, I'm stressed, and this is what I need," and that resource is there for them. And so, again, uh, to your point, as we talk about health equity, that that isn't a conversation anymore. I know it's going to take a long time for that to happen, but that increasingly, and we see this in current policies, we see the trend, somebody asked that question, um, that we, with this current administration, um, both at the federal and state level, we see a movement towards better support for family caregivers across race, ethnicity, uh, sexual gender, sexual orientation, gender identities, um, you know, rural, geographic, et cetera, we see an improvement. So my hope is that we continue on in that positive vein um, so that ultimately families can be families, no matter what condition they have, they can be families and they can care for each other and love each other without all of the extra. I uh, would like to see more power shifting. Um, I think this is a, an interesting situation where I'm so used to fighting literature on um, the role of parents having the power over children uh, to see sort of the flip when it comes to our elders, where these healthcare systems have the power over our care and decision making when it comes to our elders is just wild to me. Uh, the power over resources. Um, one determinant I never get to talk about, but it's it's work and income and how my grandmother was a part of that generation of women racialized as black that never earned pensions, worked full time, but because of racism, never got pensions. And people bring that up to me now to this day, like, oh, that generation that didn't think they needed to retire. It's like, no, she experienced the worst of this world. Where are her reparations? Where is the power shift for everything she has been dealt in this world? And so I would like to see power shift. And I'd like to see innovation because we really do have some culturally rich, beautiful approaches to elder care, but we don't have the power with it, right? Just the creativity without the power and the resources. So we can get that power shift to, to fund and bolster what we're already coming up with in our guts. We really can take care of our people. Yeah, I really like the, I like the, there used to be something that there was an old thing, FUBU, for us, by us, but really taking those, 
But thinking about that as it relates to dementia care, right? Going to communities because they often are, the they have the answers. But to your point, having that power shift and having the funding, um, having the um, the ability for people to, to recognize that they are experts in their own care and identifying what they need, I um, mean, that being a big shift. So I really appreciate all of these points today. I think that we could talk about health equity for a long time. I know I can't, I get excited to talk about health equity. I get excited about thinking about innovations and how to really make sure we're improving um, different types of strategies to really reach those who need it the most. Um, but we don't have that much time today um, because we have other things to do to make change in the world. So thank you again to all of the panelists who shared your wonderful stories, your expertise and knowledge. And thank you all in the audience who came and spent an hour and a half with us to talk about this important topic. I hope that you take this information and go in your communities and be a change agent um, to really think about change and how to include health equity in the work that you do on the day to day. And I cannot leave uh, without saying, please, please, please connect with us and stay connected. Um, we have a wonderful website, um, bolddementiacaregiving.org. This presentation today will be uploaded onto the BOLD site. Um, in addition to this wonderful webinar, we have a host of other webinars, other supports that can provide resources and materials to help you as you, as you develop your dementia caregiving um, supports and services. And also we are on X, not Twitter anymore, but X, um, and you can follow us and stay up to date on PICO underscore DC. As always, please, um, in the chat and here online, we see uh, a link here if you can provide your feedback and thoughts on this webinar and also on topics that you would like for us to explore in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a peaceful day um, and I look forward to us coming together again. Thank you.